The Peasant War in Germany by Frederick Engels Chapter 2 The Main Opposition Groups and Their Programs, Luther and Muenzer The grouping of the numerous and variegated groups into bigger units was at that time made impossible by decentralization, by local and provincial independence, by industrial and commercial isolation of the provinces from each other, and by poor means of communication. This grouping develops only with the general spread of revolutionary, religious and political ideas, in the course of the Reformation. The various groups of the population which either accept or oppose those ideas, concentrate the nation, very slowly and only approximately indeed, into three large camps, the reactionary or Catholic, the reformist middle class or Lutheran, and the revolutionary elements. If we discover little logic even in this great division of the nation, if the first two camps include partly the same elements, it is due to the fact that most of the official groupings brought over from the Middle Ages had begun to dissolve and to become decentralized, which circumstance gave to the same groups in different localities a momentary opposing orientation. In the last years we have so often met with similar facts in Germany that we will not be surprised at this apparent mixture of groups and classes under the much more complicated conditions of the 16th century. The German ideology of today sees in the struggles to which the Middle Ages had succumbed nothing but violent theological bickerings, this notwithstanding our modern experiences. Had the people of that time only been able to reach an understanding concerning the celestial things, say our patriotic historians and wise statesmen, there would have been no ground whatever for struggle over earthly affairs. These ideologists were gullible enough to accept on their face value all the illusions which an epoch maintains about itself, or which the ideologists of a certain period maintained about that period. This class of people, which saw in the revolution of 1789 nothing but a heated debate over the advantages of a constitutional monarchy as compared with absolutism, would see in the July Revolution a practical controversy over the untenability of the empire by the grace of God, and in the February Revolution, an attempt at solving the problem of a republic or monarchy, etc. Of the class struggles which were being fought out in these convulsions, and whose mere expression is being every time written as a political slogan on the banner of these class struggles, our ideologists have no conception even at the present time, although manifestations of them are audible enough not only abroad, but also from the grumbling and the resentment of many thousands of home proletarians. In the so-called religious wars of the 16th century, very positive material class interests were at play, and those wars were class wars just as were the later collisions in England and France. If the class struggles of that time appear to bear religious earmarks, if the interests, requirements and demands of the various classes hid themselves behind a religious screen, it little changes the actual situation, and is to be explained by conditions of the time. The Middle Ages had developed out of raw primitiveness. It had done away with old civilization, old philosophy, politics and jurisprudence, in order to begin anew in every respect. The only thing which it had retained from the old shattered world was Christianity and a number of half-ruined cities deprived of their civilization. As a consequence, the clergy retained a monopoly of intellectual education, a phenomenon to be found in every primitive stage of development, and education itself had acquired a predominantly theological nature. In the hands of the clergy, politics and jurisprudence, as well as other sciences, remained branches of theology, and were treated according to the principles prevailing in the latter. The dogmas of the church were at the same time political axioms, and Bible quotations had the validity of law in every court. Even after the formation of a special class of jurists, jurisprudence long remained under the tutelage of theology. This supremacy of theology in the realm of intellectual activities was at the same time a logical consequence of the situation of the church as the most general force coordinating and sanctioning existing feudal domination. It is obvious that under such conditions, all general and overt attacks on feudalism, in the first place attacks on the church, all revolutionary, social and political doctrines, necessarily became theological heresies. In order to be attacked, existing social conditions had to be stripped of their aureole of sanctity. The revolutionary opposition to feudalism was alive throughout all the Middle Ages. According to conditions of the time, 
it appeared either in the form of mysticism, as open heresy, or of armed insurrection. As mysticism, it is well known how indispensable it was for the reformers of the 16th century. Muenzer himself was largely indebted to it. The heresies were partly an expression of the reaction of the patriarchal Alpine shepherds against the encroachments of feudalism in their realm, Waldenses, partly an opposition to feudalism of the cities that had outgrown it, the Albigenses, Arnold of Brescia, etc., and partly direct insurrections of peasants, John Ball, the master from Hungary in Picardy, etc. We can omit, in this connection, the patriarchal heresy of the Waldenses, as well as the insurrection of the Swiss, which by form and contents, was a reactionary attempt at stemming the tide of historic development, and of a purely local importance. In the other two forms of medieval heresy, we find as early as the 12th century the precursors of the great division between the middle class and the peasant plebeian opposition which caused the collapse of the peasant war. This division is manifest throughout the later Middle Ages. The heresy of the cities, which is the actual official heresy of the Middle Ages, directed itself primarily against the clergy, whose riches and political importance it attacked. In the very same manner as the bourgeoisie at present demands a government a bon march, cheap government, so the middle class of medieval times demanded first of all an église a bon march, cheap church. Reactionary in form, as is every heresy which sees in the further development of church and dogma, only a degeneration, the middle class heresy demanded the restoration of the ancient simple church constitution and the abolition of an exclusive class of priests. This cheap arrangement would eliminate the monks, the prelates, the Roman court, in brief, everything which was expensive for the church. In their attack against papacy, the cities, themselves republics although under the protection of monarchs, expressed for the first time in a general form the idea that the normal form of government for the bourgeoisie was the republic. Their hostility towards many a dogma and church law is partly explained by the foregoing and partly by their conditions. Why they were so bitter against celibacy, no one has given a better explanation than Boccaccio. Arnold of Brescia in Italy and Germany, the Albigenses in South France, John Wycliffe in England, Huss and the Calix Tines in Bohemia, were the chief representatives of this opposition. That the opposition against feudalism should appear here only as an opposition against religious feudalism, is easily understood when one remembers that, at that time, the cities were already a recognized estate sufficiently capable of fighting lay feudalism with its privileges either by force of arms or in the city assemblies. Here, as in South France, in England and Bohemia, we find the lower nobility joining hands with the cities in their struggle against the clergy and in their heresies, a phenomenon due to the dependence of the lower nobility upon the cities and to the community of interests of both groups as against the princes and the prelates. The same phenomenon is found in the peasant war. A totally different character was assumed by that heresy which was a direct expression of the peasant and plebeian demands, and which was almost always connected with an insurrection. This heresy, sharing all the demands of middle-class heresy relative to the clergy, the papacy, and the restoration of the ancient Christian church organization, went far beyond them. It demanded the restoration of ancient Christian equality among the members of the community, this to be recognized as a rule for the middle-class world as well. From the equality of the children of God it made the implication as to civil equality, and partly also as to equality of property. To make the nobility equal to the peasant, the patricians and the privileged middle class equal to the plebeians, to abolish serfdom, ground rents, taxes, privileges, and at least the most flagrant differences of property these were demands put forth with more or less definiteness and regarded as naturally emanating from the ancient Christian doctrine. This peasant plebeian heresy, in the fullness of feudalism, for example, among the Albigenses, hardly distinguishable from the middle-class opposition, grew in the course of the 14th and 15th centuries to be a strongly defined party opinion appearing independently alongside the heresy of the middle class. This is the case with John Ball, preacher of the Watt Tyler insurrection in England alongside the Wycliffe movement. This is also the case with the Taborites alongside the Calix Tines in Bohemia. 
the Taborites showed even a Republican tendency under theocratic coloring, a view later developed by the representatives of the plebeians in Germany in the 15th and at the beginning of the 16th century. This form of heresy was joined in by the dream visions of the mystic sects, such as the scourging friars, the lollards, etc., which in times of suppression continued the revolutionary tradition. The plebeians of that time were the only class outside of the existing official society. It was outside the feudal, as well as outside the middle class organization. It had neither privileges nor property, it was deprived even of the possessions owned by peasant or petty bourgeois, burdened with crushing duties as much as they might be, it was deprived of property and rights in every respect, it lived in such a manner that it did not even come into direct contact with the existing institutions, which ignored it completely. It was a living symptom of the dissolution of the feudal and guild middle class societies, and it was at the same time the first precursor of modern bourgeois society. This position of the plebeians is sufficient explanation as to why the plebeian opposition of that time could not be satisfied with fighting feudalism and the privileged middle class alone, why, in fantasy, at least, it reached beyond modern bourgeois society then only in its inception, why, being an absolutely propertyless faction, it questioned institutions, views and conceptions common to every society based on division of classes. The Kiliastic dream visions ancient Christianity offered in this respect a very serviceable starting point. On the other hand, this reaching out beyond not only the present but also the future, could not help being violently fantastic. At the first practical application, it naturally fell back into narrow limits set by prevailing conditions. The attack on private property, the demand for community of possession had to solve itself into a crude organization of charity, vague Christian equality could result in nothing but civic equality before the law, abolition of all officialdom transformed itself finally in the organization of republican governments elected by the people. Anticipation of communism by human fantasy was in reality anticipation of modern bourgeois conditions. This anticipation of coming stages of historic development, forced in itself, but a natural outcome of the life conditions of the plebeian group, is first to be noted in Germany, in the teachings of Thomas Muenzer and his party. Already the Taborites showed a kind of kiliastic community of property, but this was a purely military measure. Only in the teachings of Muenzer did these communist notions find expression as the desires of a vital section of society. Through him they were formulated with a certain definiteness, and were afterwards found in every great convulsion of the people, until gradually they merged with the modern proletarian movement. Something similar we observe in the Middle Ages, where the struggles of the free peasants against increasing feudal domination merged with the struggles of the serfs and bondsmen for the complete abolition of the feudal system. While the first of the three large camps, the conservative Catholics, embraced all the elements interested in maintaining the existing imperial power, the ecclesiastical and a section of the lay princes, the richer nobility, the prelates and the city patricians the middle-class moderate Lutheran reform gathered under its banner all the propertied elements of the opposition, the mass of the lower nobility, the middle class and even a portion of the lay princes who hoped to enrich themselves. Through the confiscation of the church estates and to seize the opportunity for establishing greater independence from the empire. As to the peasants and plebeians, they grouped themselves around the revolutionary party whose demands and doctrines found their boldest expression in Muenzer. Luther and Muenzer, in their doctrines, in their characters, in their actions, accurately embodied the tenets of their separate parties. Between 1517 and 1525, Luther had gone through the same transformations as the German constitutionalists between 1846 and 1849. This has been the case with every middle-class party which, having marched for a while at the head of the movement, has been overwhelmed by the plebeian proletarian party pressing from the rear. When in 1517 opposition against the dogmas and the organization of the Catholic Church was first raised by Luther, it still had no definite character. Not exceeding the demands of the earlier middle-class heresy, it did not exclude any trend of opinion which went further. It could not do so because the first moment of the struggle demanded that all opposing elements be united, the most aggressive revolutionary energy be utilized. 
and the totality of the existing heresies fighting the Catholic orthodoxy be represented. In a similar fashion, our liberal bourgeoisie of 1847 were still revolutionary. They called themselves socialists and communists, and they discussed emancipation of the working class. Luther's sturdy peasant nature asserted itself in the stormiest fashion in the first period of his activities. If the raging madness of the Roman churchmen were to continue, it seems to me no better counsel and remedy could be found against it than that kings and princes apply force, arm themselves, attack those evil people who have poisoned the entire world, and once and for all make an end to this game, with arms, not with words. If thieves are being punished with swords, murderers with ropes, and heretics with fire, why do we not seize, with arms in hand, all those evil teachers of perdition, those popes, bishops, cardinals, and the entire crew of Roman Sodom? Why do we not wash our hands in their blood? This revolutionary ardor did not last long. The lightning thrust by Luther caused a conflagration. A movement started among the entire German people. In his appeals against the clergy, in his preaching of Christian freedom, peasants and plebeians perceived the signal for insurrection. Likewise, the moderate middle class and a large section of the lower nobility joined him, and even princes were drawn into the torrent. While the former believed the day had come in which to wreak vengeance upon all their oppressors, the latter only wished to break the power of the clergy, the dependence upon Rome, the Catholic hierarchy, and to enrich themselves through the confiscation of church property. The parties became separated from each other, and each found a different spokesman. Luther had to choose between the two. Luther, the protege of the Elector of Saxony, the respected professor of Wittenberg who had become powerful and famous overnight, the great man who was surrounded by a coterie of servile creatures and flatterers, did not hesitate a moment. He dropped the popular elements of the movement, and joined the train of the middle class, the nobility and the princes. Appeals to war of extermination against Rome were heard no more. Luther was now preaching peaceful progress and passive resistance. Cf. to the nobility of the German nation, 1520, etc. Invited by Hutton to visit him and seeking an in the castle of Eberne, the center of the noble conspiracy against clergy and princes, Luther replied, I should not like to see the gospel defended by force and bloodshed. The world was conquered by the word, the church has maintained itself by the word, the church will come into its own again through the word, and as Antichrist gained ascendancy without violence, so without violence he will fall. Out of this turn of mind, or, to be more exact, out of this definite delineation of Luther's policy, sprang that policy bartering and haggling over institutions and dogmas to be retained or reformed, that ugly diplomatising, conceding, intriguing and compromising, the result of which was the Augsburg Confession, the final draft of the Constitution the reformed middle-class church. It was the same petty trading which, in the political field, repeated itself ad nauseum in the recent German national assemblies, unity gatherings, chambers of revision, and in the parliaments of Erfurt. The Philistine middle-class character of the official reformation appeared in these negotiations most clearly. There were valid reasons why Luther, now the recognized representative of middle-class reform, chose to preach lawful progress. The mass of the cities had joined the cause of moderate reform, the lower nobility became more and more devoted to it, one section of the princes joined it, another vacillated. Success was almost certain at least in a large portion of Germany. Under continued peaceful development the other regions could not in the long run withstand the pressure of moderate opposition. Violent convulsions, on the other hand, were bound to result in a conflict between the moderates and the extreme plebeian and peasant party, thus to alienate the princes, the nobility, and a number of cities from the movement and to leave open the alternative of either the middle class party being overshadowed by the peasants and plebeians, or the entire movement being crushed by Catholic restoration. How middle class parties, having achieved the slightest victory, attempt to steer their way between the Scylla of revolution and the Charybdis of restoration by means of lawful progress, we have had occasions enough to observe in the events of recent times.
it was in the nature of the then prevailing social and political conditions that the results of every change were advantageous to the princes, increasing their power. Thus it came about that the middle class reform, having parted ways with the plebeian and peasant elements, fell more and more under the control of the reform princes. Luther's subservience to them increased, and the people knew very well what they were doing when they accused him of having become a slave of the princes as were all the others, and when they pursued him with stones in Orlamuende. When the peasant war broke out, becoming more predominant in regions with Catholic nobility and princes, Luther strove to maintain a conciliatory position. He resolutely attacked the governments. He said it was due to their oppression that the revolts had started, that not the peasants alone were against them, but God as well. On the other hand, he also said that the revolt was ungodly and against the gospel. He advised both parties to yield, to reach a peaceful understanding. Notwithstanding these sincere attempts at conciliation, however, the revolt spread rapidly over large areas, including such sections as were dominated by Protestant Lutheran princes, nobles and cities, and rapidly outgrew the middle-class circumspect reform. The most determined faction of the insurgents under Muenzer opened their headquarters in Luther's very proximity, in Thuringia. A few more successes, and Germany would have been one big conflagration, Luther would have been surrounded, perhaps piked as a traitor, and middle-class reform would have been swept away by the tides of a peasant plebeian revolution. There was no more time for circumspection. In the face of the revolution, all old animosities were forgotten. Compared with the hordes of peasants, the servants of the Roman Sodom were innocent lambs, sweet-tempered children of God. Burger and prince, noble and clergyman, Luther and the Pope united against the murderous and plundering hordes of the peasants. They should be knocked to pieces, strangled and stabbed, secretly and openly, by everybody who can do it, just as one must kill a mad dog. Luther cried. Therefore, dear gentlemen, hearken here, save there, stab, knock, strangle them at will, and if thou diest, thou art blessed, no better death canst thou ever attain. No false mercy was to be practiced in relation to the peasants. Whoever hath pity on those whom God pities not, whom he wishes punished and destroyed, shall be classed among the rebellious himself. Later, he said, the peasants would learn to thank God when they had to give away one cow in order that they might enjoy the other in peace. Through the revolution, he said, the princes would learn the spirit of the mob which could reign by force only. The wise man says, Sibus, Onus et Verga Messino. The heads of the peasants are full of chaff. They do not hearken to the word, and they are senseless, so they must hearken to the verga and the gun, and this is only just. We must pray for them that they obey. Where they do not, there should not be much mercy. Let the guns roar among them, or else they will make it a thousand times worse. It is the same language that was used by our late socialist and philanthropic bourgeoisie, when, after the March days the proletariat also demanded its share in the fruits of victory. Luther had given the plebeian movement a powerful weapon a translation of the Bible. Through the Bible, he contrasted feudal Christianity of his time with moderate Christianity of the first century. In opposition to decaying feudal society, he held up the picture of another society which knew nothing of the ramified and artificial feudal hierarchy. The peasants had made extensive use of this weapon against the forces of the princes, the nobility, and the clergy. Now Luther turned the same weapon against the peasants, extracting from the Bible a veritable hymn to the authorities ordained by God a feat hardly exceeded by any lackey of absolute monarchy. Princedom by the grace of God, passive resistance, even serfdom, were being sanctioned by the Bible. Thus Luther repudiated not only the peasant insurrection but even his own revolt against religious and lay authority. He not only betrayed the popular movement to the princes, but the middle class movement as well. Need we mention other bourgeois who recently gave us examples of repudiating their own past? Let us now compare the plebeian revolutionary, Muenzer, with the middle-class reformist, Luther. Thomas Muenzer was born in Stahlberg, in the Hartz, in 1498. 
it is said that his father died on the scaffold, a victim of the willfulness of the Count of Stahlberg. In his fifteenth year, Muenzer organized at the Halley School a secret union against the Archbishop of Magdeburg and the Roman Church in general. His scholarly attainments in the theology of his time brought him early the doctor's degree and the position of chaplain in a Halley nunnery. Here he began to treat the dogmas and rites of the Church with the greatest contempt. At Mass he omitted the words of the transubstantiation, and ate, as Luther said, the Almighty God's unconsecrated. Medieval mystics, especially the Kiliastic works of Joachim of Calabria, were the main subject of his studies. It seemed to Muenzer that the millennium and the day of judgment over the degenerated church and the corrupted world, as announced and pictured by that mystic, had come in the form of the Reformation and the general restlessness of his time. He preached in his neighborhood with great success. In 1520 he went to Tvikau as the first evangelist preacher. There he found one of those dreamy Kiliastic sects which continued their existence in many localities, hiding behind an appearance of humility and detachment, the rankly growing opposition of the lower strata of society against existing conditions, and with the growth of agitation, beginning to press to the foreground more boldly and with more endurance. It was the sect of the Anabaptists headed by Nicholas Storch. The Anabaptists preached the approach of the Day of Judgment and of the Millennium, they had visions, convulsions, and the spirit of prophecy. They soon came into conflict with the Council of Tvikau. Muenzer defended them, though he had never joined them unconditionally, and had rather brought them under his own influence. The Council took decisive steps against them, they were compelled to leave the city, and Muenzer departed with them. This was at the end of 1521. He then went to Prague and, in order to gain ground, attempted to join the remnants of the Hussite movement. His proclamations, however, made it necessary for him to flee Bohemia also. In 1522, he became preacher at Altstedt in Thuringia. Here he started with reforming the cult. Before even Luther dared to go so far, he entirely abolished the Latin language, and ordered the entire Bible, not only the prescribed Sunday Gospels and Epistles, to be read to the people. At the same time, he organized propaganda in his locality. People flocked to him from all directions, and soon Altstedt became the center of the popular anti-priest movement of entire Thuringia. Muenzer at that time was still theologian before everything else. He directed his attacks almost exclusively against the priests. He did not, however, preach quiet debate and peaceful progress, as Luther had begun to do at that time, but he continued the early violent preachments of Luther, appealing to the princes of Saxony and the people to rise in arms against the Roman priests. Is it not Christ who said, I have come to bring, not peace, but the sword? What can you the princes of Saxony do with that sword? You can do only one thing, if you wish to be the servants of God, you must drive out and destroy the evil ones who stand in the way of the gospel. Christ ordered very earnestly, Luke, 19, 27, But these mine enemies, that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, and slay them before me. Do not resort to empty assertions that the power of God could do it without aid of our sword, since then it would have to rust in its sheath. We must destroy those who stand in the way of God's revelation, we must do it mercilessly, as Hezekiah, Cyrus, Josiah, Daniel and Elias destroyed the priests of Baal, else the Christian church will never come back to its origins. We must uproot the weeds in God's vineyard at the time when the crops are ripe. God said in the fifth book of Moses, 7, Thou shalt not show mercy unto the idolaters, but ye shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their graven images and burn them with fire that I shall not be wroth at you. But these appeals to the princes were of no avail, whereas the revolutionary agitation among the people grew day by day. Muenzer, whose ideas became more definitely shaped and more courageous, now definitely relinquished the middle-class reformation, and at the same time appeared as a direct political agitator. His theologic-philosophic doctrine attacked all the main points not only of Catholicism but of Christianity as such. Under the cloak of Christian forms, he preached a kind of pantheism, 
which curiously resembles the modern speculative mode of contemplation, and at times even taught open atheism. He repudiated the assertion that the Bible was the only infallible revelation. The only living revelation, he said, was reason, a revelation which existed among all peoples at all times. To contrast the Bible with reason, he maintained, was to kill the spirit by the latter, for the Holy Spirit of which the Bible spoke was not a thing outside of us, the Holy Spirit was our reason. Faith, he said, was nothing else but reason become alive in man, therefore, he said, pagans could also have faith. Through this faith, through reason come to life, man became godlike and blessed, he said. Heaven was to be sought in this life, not beyond, and it was, according to Muenzer, the task of the believers to establish heaven, the kingdom of God, here on earth. As there is no heaven in the beyond, so there is no hell in the beyond, and no damnation, and there are no devils but the evil desires and cravings of man. Christ, he said, was a man, as we are, a prophet and a teacher, and his Lord's Supper is nothing but a plain meal of commemoration wherein bread and wine are being consumed with mystic additions. Muenzer preached these doctrines mostly in a covered fashion, under the cloak of Christian phraseology which the new philosophy was compelled to utilize for some time. The fundamental heretic idea, however, is easily discernible in all his writings, and it is obvious that the biblical cloak was for him of much less importance than it was for many a disciple of Hegel in modern times. Still, there is a distance of 300 years between Muenzer and modern philosophy. Muenzer's political doctrine followed his revolutionary religious conceptions very closely, and as his theology reached far beyond the current conceptions of his time, so his political doctrine went beyond existing social and political conditions. As Muenzer's philosophy of religion touched upon atheism, so his political program touched upon communism, and there is more than one communist sect of modern times which, on the eve of the February Revolution, did not possess a theoretical equipment as rich as that of Muenzer of the 16th century. His program, less a compilation of the demands of the then existing plebeians than a genius's anticipation of the conditions for the emancipation of the proletarian element that had just begun to develop among the plebeians, demanded the immediate establishment of the kingdom of God, of the prophesied millennium on earth. This was to be accomplished by the return of the church to its origins and the abolition of all institutions that were in conflict with what Muenzer conceived as original Christianity, which, in fact, was the idea of a very modern church. By the kingdom of God, Muenzer understood nothing else than a state of society without class differences, without private property, and without superimposed state powers opposed to the members of society. All existing authorities, as far as they did not submit and join the revolution, he taught, must be overthrown, all work and all property must be shared in common, and complete equality must be introduced. In his conception, a union of the people was to be organized to realize this program, not only throughout Germany, but throughout entire Christendom. Princes and nobles were to be invited to join, and should they refuse, the union was to overthrow or kill them, with arms in hand, at the first opportunity. Muenzer immediately set to work to organize the Union. His preachings assumed a still more militant character. He attacked, not only the clergy, but with equal passion the princes, the nobility and the patricians. He pictured in burning colors the existing oppression, and contrasted it with the vision of the millennium of social republican equality which he created out of his imagination. He published one revolutionary pamphlet after another, sending emissaries in all directions, while he personally organized the Union in Altstedt and its vicinity. The first fruit of this propaganda was the destruction of St. Mary's Chapel in Melurbach near Altstedt, according to the command of the Bible, Deuteronomy 7, 5, Ye shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and hew down their asherim, and burn their graven images with fire. The princes of Saxony came in person to Altstedt quell the upheaval, and they called Muenzer to the castle. There he delivered a sermon, which they had never heard from Luther, that easy living flesh of Wittenberg, Muenzer called him. He insisted that the ungodly rulers, 
especially the priests and monks who treated the gospel as heresy, must be killed, for confirmation he referred to the New Testament. The ungodly have no right to live, he said, save by the mercy of the chosen ones. If the princes would not exterminate the ungodly, he asserted, God would take their sword from them because the right to wield the sword belongs to the community. The source of the evil of usury, thievery and robbery, he said, were the princes and the masters who had taken all creatures into their private possession the fishes in the water, the birds in the air, the plants in the soil. And the usurpers, he said, still preached to the poor the commandment, Thou shalt not steal, while they grabbed everything, and robbed and crushed the peasant and the artisan. When, however, one of the latter commits the slightest transgression, he said, he has to hang, and Dr. Lyre says to all this, Amen. The masters themselves created a situation, he argued, in which the poor man was forced to become their enemy. If they did not remove the causes of the upheaval, how could things improve in times to come? He asked. Oh, my dear gentlemen, how the Lord will smite with an iron rod all these old pots. When I say so, I am considered rebellious. So be it. C.F. Zimmerman's Peasant War, 2, p. 75. Muenzer had the sermon printed. His Altstedt printer was punished by Duke Johann of Saxony with banishment. His own writings were to be henceforth subjected to the censorship of the ducal government in Weimar. But he paid no heed to this order. He immediately published a very inciting paper in the imperial city of Mühlhausen, wherein he admonished the people to widen the hole so that all the world may see and comprehend who our fools are who have blasphemously turned our Lord into a painted mannequin. He concluded with the following words, All the world must suffer a big jolt. The game will be such that the ungodly will be thrown off their seats and the downtrodden will rise. As a motto, Thomas Muenzer, the man with the hammer, wrote the following on the title page, Beware, I have put my words into thy mouth, I have lifted thee above the people and above the empires that thou mayest uproot, destroy, scatter and overthrow, and that thou mayest build and plant. A wall of iron against the kings, princes, priests, and for the people hath been erected. Let them fight, for victory is wondrous, and the strong and godless tyrants will perish. The breach between Muenzer and Luther with his party had taken place long before that. Luther himself was compelled to accept some church reforms which were introduced by Muenzer without consulting him. Luther watched Muenzer's activities with the nettled distrust of a moderate reformer towards an energetic far-aiming radical. Already in the spring of 1524, in a letter to Melanchthon, that model of a hectic stay-at-home Philistine, Muenzer wrote that he and Luther did not understand the movement at all. They were seeking, he said, to choke it by adherence to the letter of the Bible, and their doctrine was worm-eaten. Dear brethren, he wrote, stop your delaying and hesitating. The time has come, the summer is knocking at our doors. Do not keep friendship with the ungodly who prevent the word from exercising its full force. Do not flatter your princes in order that you may not perish with them. Yet tender, bookish scholars, do not be wroth, for I cannot do otherwise. Luther had more than once invited Muenzer to an open debate. The latter, however, being always ready to accept battle in the presence of the people, did not have the slightest desire to plunge into a theological squabble before the partisan public of the Wittenberg University. He had no desire to bring the testimony of the spirit before the high school of learning exclusively. If Luther was sincere, he wrote, let him use his influence to stop the chicaneries against his, muenzers, printers, and to lift the censorship in order that their controversy might be freely fought out in the press. When the above-mentioned revolutionary brochure appeared, Luther openly denounced muenzer. In his letter to the princes of Saxony against the rebellious spirit, he declared muenzer to be an instrument of Satan, and demanded of the princes to intervene, and drive the instigators of the upheaval out of the country, since, he said, they did not confine themselves to preaching their evil doctrine, but incited to insurrection, to violent lawless action against the authorities. On August 1, 
Muenzer was compelled to appear before the princes in the castle of Weimar, to defend himself against the accusation of incendiary machinations. There were highly compromising facts quoted against him, his secret union had been traced, his hand was discovered in the organization of the peatmen and the peasants. He was being threatened with banishment. Upon returning to Eitzstedt, he learned Duke George of Saxony demanded his extradition. Union letters in his handwriting had been intercepted, wherein he called George's subjects to armed resistance against the enemies of the gospel. The council would have extradited him had he not left the city. In the meantime, the rising agitation among the peasants and the plebeians had enormously lightened Muenzer's task of propaganda. In the person of the Anabaptists he found invaluable agents. This sect, having no definite dogmas, held together by common opposition against all ruling classes and by the common symbol of second baptism, ascetic in their mode of living, untiring, fanatic and intrepid in propaganda, had grouped itself more closely around Muenzer. Made homeless by constant persecutions, its members wandered over the length and breadth of Germany, announcing everywhere the new gospel wherein Muenzer had made clear to them their own demands and wishes. Numberless Anabaptists were put on the rack, burned or otherwise executed. But the courage and endurance of these emissaries were unshaken, and the success of their activities amidst the rapidly rising agitation of the people was enormous. That was one of the reasons why, on his flight from Thuringia, Muenzer found the ground prepared wherever he turned. In Nuremberg, a peasant revolt had been nipped in the bud a month previous. Here Muenzer conducted his propaganda under cover. Soon there appeared persons who defended his most audacious theological doctrines of the non-obligatory power of the Bible and the meaninglessness of sacraments, declaring Christ to have been a mere man, and the power of lay authorities to be ungodly. We see there Satan stalking, the spirit of Altstedt. Luther exclaimed. In Nuremberg, Muenzer printed his reply to Luther. He accused him of flattering the princes and supporting the reactionary party by his moderate position. The people will free themselves in spite of everything, he wrote, and then the fate of Dr. Luther will be that of a captive fox. The city council ordered the paper confiscated, and Muenzer was compelled to leave the city. From there he went through Suabia to Alsace, then to Switzerland, and then back to the upper Black Forest where the insurrection had started several months before, precipitated largely by the Anabaptist emissaries. There is no doubt that this propaganda trip of Muenzer's added much to the organization of the People's Party, to a clear formulation of its demands and to the final general outbreak of the insurrection in April, 1525. It was through this trip that the dual nature of Muenzer's activities became more and more pronounced on the one hand, his propaganda among the people whom he approached in the only language then comprehensible to the masses, that of religious prophecy, on the other hand, his contact with the initiated, to whom he could disclose his ultimate aims. Even previous to this journey he had grouped around himself in Thuringia a circle of the most determined persons, not only from among the people, but also from among the lower clergy, a circle whom he had put at the head of the secret organization. Now he became the center of the entire revolutionary movement of southwest Germany, organizing connections between Saxony and Thuringia through Franconia and Suabia up to Alsace and the Swiss frontier and counting among his disciples and the heads of the organization such men as Hubmayer of Waldschut, Konrad Grebel of Zurich, Franz Ravmann of Gryason, Schapeler of Memmingen, Jacob Wea of Lyfeim, and Drive. Mantel in Stuttgart, the most revolutionary of priests. He kept himself mostly in Gryason on the Schaffhausen frontier, undertaking journeys through the Hegau, Kletgau, etc. The bloody persecutions undertaken by the alarmed princes and masters everywhere against this new plebeian heresy, aided not a little in fanning the rebellious spirit and closing the ranks of the organization. In this way, Muenzer passed five months in Upper Germany. When the outbreak of the general movement was at hand, he returned to Thuringia, where he wished to lead the movement personally. There we will find him later. We shall see how truly the character and the behavior of the two party heads reflected the position of their respective parties. Luther's indecision, his fear of the movement, assumed serious proportions, 
his cowardly servility towards the princes corresponded closely to the hesitating, vacillating policy of the middle classes. The revolutionary energy and decisiveness of Muenzer, on the other hand, was seen in the most advanced faction of the plebeians and peasants. The difference was that while Luther confined himself to an expression of the ideas and wishes of a majority of his class and thereby acquired among it a very cheap popularity, Muenzer, on the contrary, went far beyond the immediate ideas and demands of the plebeians and peasants, organizing out of the then existing revolutionary elements a party, which, as far as it stood on the level of his ideas and shared his energy, still represented only a small minority of the insurgent masses.